In this video, we're going to take a look at some of the feature-based modeling aspects of the Inventor software. I'm going to begin by looking in Chapter 1 of our Working Files directory and grabbing this feature-based model. Once the model opens up, I can notice that I have a part modeling environment in front of me. So this is initially just an IPT, just a standard part file, and with it, I have a model browser on the left-hand side of my screen. Now this will tell me what file I'm currently in, again, that feature-based model.ipt. If you don't have file extensions turned on in Windows, you may not see the IPT behind it, so you might want to turn those on in your Windows system. And beyond this, I have different things listed here, such as a solid bodies folder, a view master folder. I have a list of the origin planes of the part file, so the YZ, the XZ, and the XY planes. Based on how this part was built, it probably used some intelligence on these origins so that things updated in an expected manner. As we start looking at the rest of the history that's over here, we have an extrusion, a face draft, these different modeling tools that generated this IPT here. How was this built? How do I examine this to go back through and see how this was initially created? Because it's really starting to pique my interest. I can take this end of part marker here at the end of the list. And if I take this and I drag it up to the top, right beneath extrusion one and above face draft one, this will show me what this initially was when it was created. Here I have extrusion one, which is a modeling feature. And inside of this, I have a sketch that helped create this. Now, some things in this software are sketch based where I had to draw a two dimensional representation before I give it thickness or give it a standard type of modeling function, such as an extrusion. Other things are pick in place. So the next item beneath that, if I take end of part marker and I drag it down beyond the face draft, this will show me that the faces were drafted in a little bit from the sides. And this was a pick in place feature. I didn't have to sketch anything. And the tell for that is I don't see a sketch underneath face draft. Next up, I have a fillet, which adds some curvature to the exterior and interior edges of this part. And then a shell. If I were to rotate this, to see the bottom side. And you can do that with this cube up here. So I can see the bottom side of this is actually hollow now. So my shell is another nice pick and place feature. And then I have another extrusion here. So it adds some thickness on the inside of this. Another extrusion that actually removes some material from the inside of that. A fillet, then a hole, and then a mirror operation. As we uncover more aspects of the software and we develop good tendencies for how we approach modeling, we're going to get really good at how we control our history tree. Essentially, this is like our timeline. The end of part marker was my DeLorean. I was able to jump back in that car, go back in time to 1984, and visit the history that made up this design. Now, that's a really nice way to kind of go back through and see it being built. But one thing to keep in mind about history is you have relationships throughout history where you have parent and child relationships. So you weren't just created one day. You actually were born. You have parents. You might have children yourself. And that follows a natural flow of history. If I were to come back in time here and damage, let's say, my shell or my extrusion, that can have lasting effects on the rest of my history tree. So for instance, if I go back here to the shell, now this shell was used as a parent reference for my extrusion to be created. If I delete my shell, I get an option here that says, would you like to additionally delete these dependent sketches and features? I'm gonna say okay for right now. And what happens is it basically gets rid of everything else because the shell never happened. Therefore, the children features that existed never happened as well. I'm gonna do an undo, and that's very easy to do in the software. You can just right click and choose undo from this marking menu. Now let's say I delete the shell, but this time I uncheck this box to try to keep the children. Now when I do this, I will still get errors. It will automatically create some additional work planes that I have to use to repair this geometry, and I have some bubbles here telling me I got a problem. Not generally a good thing to do. So let me undo this. The problem with history is if you don't know how history was written, sometimes you have a problem understanding the future of design. If I were to come in here and make some logical changes, though, based on known history, I can make some really powerful changes and change my future on this part. For instance, if I go back to the original extrusion and I come in here to the sketch. So here's my feature. Here's my sketch that created it. 
I can see that there's a value of 150 that controls that length. What I'm going to do is right click on extrusion one and use this show dimensions option. From here, I'll change 150 by double clicking on it and I'll change it to 200. There you can see it gets a little bit longer. I'm also going to change the 227 here to 250 millimeters. Now you're not seeing anything really update yet. You're seeing the sketch change, but the feature model hasn't updated yet. That's because when you use this show dimensions method, you only get the ability to see the preview of some of the values changing. To see the model actually change though, you have to go up to your quick access toolbar at the top of the screen here, and there's a little lightning bolt there called local update. When I click on that, it will process those changes in history and show me what has been done. So there you can see I made some really nice changes to my history. I didn't affect those other features I created and everything's still good. Now when I go into my extrusion two here, I can look at that sketch. This time I double clicked on sketch two to activate it. Right now I have some loose geometry. It's actually floating around. And the problem with this is if I don't lock this in with a parametric dimension, then this creates a very loose piece of geometry that could update in a very unexpected manner downstream. Our goal of sketches is to create them to be fully constrained. So what I'm gonna do is create a dimension here really quick. Again, right click, general dimension. Here I'll go ahead and link this from this side edge here, just to the midpoint of this circle. And I'll put that down to be 60 from that edge. This is a fully constrained sketch now. It doesn't float anywhere anymore. And when I finish my sketch here at the upper right area of my sketch tab, see the green check mark there, approve that, and it'll make the parametric change for me. Now I can also adjust my fillet size. I could have adjusted my extrusion depth and size on that as well to go a little bit further, but I think you're getting the idea now. Next up, I'm going to look at this hole and how this was created. Again, here it doesn't require a sketch to create this. This was initially just a pick and place feature. So I can right click on this. Here I'm gonna choose edit feature. Yes, I could use show dimensions as well. I see there's a few dimensions on it, but I'm gonna go ahead and edit this feature. Brings up my whole dialog. I'm gonna change a few of these values. So instead of 80 from this edge over here, I'm gonna make that 120. And when I hit enter to update that, you can see the other hole, which was mirrored from that one, also updates. Because this hole was a child of this one due to this mirror operation. So what we've seen in this video is essentially a good understanding of history in our designs and how when we update something it can have positive or negative effects on the future of our part designs.